Which are the best and worst units in Polytopia? Today, Poly Champions will rank each unit in the game. Drylands units from warriors to mindbenders, naval units from rafts to bombers, even the super units. More importantly, we'll tell you why these units are good or not, and explain their strengths and weaknesses. Okay, let's rank all the units in Polytopia. First, let's rank the regular tribe Drylands units. Starting from the bottom in F tier, we have the Mindbender. The poster child of a unit which could be great in theory, but in reality is pretty useless. Personally, I love the Mindbender, but its position as the worst unit in the game is undeniable. The Mindbender's power to convert an opponent's unit would be great if not for the fact that your opponent will kill it first. People don't just place units and let them chill next to a Mindbender. Also, to get a Mindbender, you need Philosophy, the Tier 3 tech, in addition to Meditation, which is a pretty useless technology. Healing also seems like a good concept, but it's almost impossible to use. The C in C tier is for Swordsmen. Okay, Swordsman doesn't really start with the letter C, but the unit really epitomizes this tier by being so incredibly underwhelming. Swordsmen are locked behind a tier 3 tech, smithery, but unlike knights and catapults, which are great, swordsmen feel like units you don't even really want to use. If you're chinchy and getting giants with forges, swordsmen are a natural upgrade to the warrior, but for every other tribe, swordsmen are expensive and trapped in a tech you'll never see. Starting in the B tier is the warrior. Most tribes start with a warrior and every tribe can make them. At two stars, warriors are great bang for your buck. But they're not all that good. Early to mid game, they'll serve you well. But by the late game, they will have been outdone in all categories by some other unit. Jack of all trades, master of none is a good way to describe the warrior. Next up, we have the defender, the warrior's bulkier, well-protected cousin. If you can clear a city for a defender to land on, you're in an ideal spot. Defenders are great for pushing into an opponent's territory, enabling a zone of control to let units like archers and catapults attack from safety. Also, defenders help with walls, some economic strategies, and stalling for time before an inevitable defeat. A solid, if situational, unit. Lastly, in B tier is the opposite of the defender, the catapult. They pack a punch with an attack of four and come from the mathematics tech, which is generally useful for getting population and giants from terrain with lots of forest tiles. The downside to catapults is that they're difficult to use and costly. They cannot move and attack on the same turn and are vulnerable if you don't have other units to protect them. First in A tier are cloaks and daggers. For this video, we're talking about these two units in combination. Cloaks and daggers are great units that can't quite make the S tier. They punish an opponent for the crime of having a high level city. When cloaks hit, they steal an opponent's income and spawn up to five warrior-like dagger units, all likely to have defense bonuses and take no retaliation. Cloaks and daggers only miss out on the S tier because of how vulnerable cloaks are and how difficult it can be to land an infiltration. Other downside to cloaks are that they're difficult to afford in games without embassies, locked behind a tier three tech, and not effective when targeting lower level cities. Knights are next in A tier. Knights are a necessary part of the late game, allowing a player to clear out multiple enemies at once. Their attack of 3.5 makes them strong enough that they can one-shot most units without a defense bonus, kill, and keep on killing. The only thing holding them back is their lack of defense and bulk, as well as being sequestered behind the fairly useless freed spirit tech. Last in A tier, we have the rich man's rider, the archer. Strategically, archers are very similar to riders, but in a tier 2 tech and with a different utility. While riders expand across a map, archers love cramped tight spaces. 
Archers attack like riders, but they don't take retaliation damage, making them excellent for dealing with bulky units like giants, swordsmen, and defenders. The only problem is their range is limited, and being locked behind hunting makes them a tier down from the rider. In S tier, we have the best all-around unit for Drylands maps, the rider. Riders are a staple of the game and in most cases a strategic must with their location next to roads and the tech tree. Riders cost three stars and lack the defense of warriors, but riders can move twice as far and have the escape ability. This allows a player with riders to pile on multiple attacks at a specific weak point, explore quickly, and keep you in the driver's seat putting on the pressure, then retreating to safety. Now let's add in the special tribe Drylands units. Starting from the bottom, we have the Ice Fortress. Yes, they are just as bad as mind benders. If you are trying to make the most useless unit imaginable, take notes on this thing. It's locked behind Polaris' best unit, the sled, spoiler alert, costs three times as much and can't attack on this turn that it moves. At least it deals ranged retaliation and has enough bulk to take some hits, but that's all these things will do, take hits and die. In every scenario, other Polaris units are more cost effective and just better. Fichi on drylands go in C tier. These things may poison other units, but on a drylands map, the question is, why bother? Yes, poisoning a unit inside a wall strips away its defenses, but that kind of scenario rarely presents itself. Taking into archery for a fragile fly that lacks escape feels like a waste. They are much better on water, and we'll get into that later. Another C-tier special unit is the Ice Archer. I know, I know. Ice Archers freeze enemy units. It makes it easy for riders to take down a giant. But most of the time, they just get in the way. Polaris has better units that can freeze and don't require to go out of your way in the tech tree. Plus, compare Ice Archers to a regular one. Against an enemy warrior, just shoot, then get a rider to kill with no retaliation. With the Ice Archer, you need another unit to get this same kill. The Ice Archer isn't the worst Polaris unit, but it's not that great either. Similar to Defenders, Symantis Ketons are in the B tier. Their stats are identical to Defenders, but they have the ability to poison units that attack them. Sadly, their lack of fortify is a drawback, meaning Symanti lacks walled defenders, but the retaliation poison is still a nasty defensive mechanism and often deters attackers. Ketons patch that defensive hole for Symanti, which lacks any other type of bulky unit to land a siege with. Next up, the Dumux. These powerful units boast more range, health, defense, and attack than hexapods or even centipedes. They also have the ability to explode themselves and poison surrounding enemies. The downside is that Dumix are trapped in an unfortunate tech and cost a ridiculous 10 stars. However, a Symanti player will generally have a ton of stars in the late game with high level cities and all the other units being pretty cheap. So the Dumux are a decent option for spending big and cleaning up in the late game. Also in B tier are the Symanti versions of catapults, the Exida. Although it has a lower attack than a catapult, it's easier to move thanks to its two movement. An added perk is that when an Exida attacks, it has splash and poison. Just beware to protect them because they are vulnerable and have almost no defense. Politars are the only unit in the A tier. They are bulkier and stronger than a warrior, but weaker in terms of defense. These bad boys are unique in that they're the only units not trained from a city. Illyrian has access to them from turn zero. Plus, they're incredibly cheap to train, give Illyrian the unique poly push tactic, and help explore fast. Beyond that, they're fantastic for rushing an opponent near your capital. However, they are in short supply, 
requiring an animal on a forest tile to train one. The S in S tier is for the shaman. Symantis' signature unit and the engine for their entire game, the shaman is the most powerful support unit ever created. Seriously, Symantis falls apart without them. A boost from a shaman adds a finite movement and attack increase, allowing hexapods to outrange riders, one-shot warriors, and no longer die to retaliation if a warrior has a defense bonus. While the opportunity is rare, shamans can also convert. Symanti is the tribe most likely to get philosophy outside of Imo, because shamans really are that good. Of course, the shaman shares a tear with their creepy, crawly co-conspirators, the hexapods. Hexapods come from the riding tech, cost three stars, and are horrifying. They're known mainly for sneaking out of the fog when you're just about to capture a village and destroying your entire army like it's nothing. Once boosted, they have the attack of a knight. They may be glass cannons, but they're so easy to get. Hexapods have every tool you could want. They ignore the enemy zone of control with sneak, easily traverse forests with creep, and are able to retreat after an attack with escape. They are Polytopia's perfect little killing machines. Are you struggling with your opponent's units? Just try the Hexapod. 90% of your opponent's units will be gone in just one attack. Warrior about to capture a village? Not anymore. Experiencing symptoms related to lost elo? Get that elo back. Giant problem? Up the dosage to 5. Hexapods may only be available for Symanti and not covered by your insurance, but for only 3 stars, they're a cost-effective option for any game plan and available to your local riding deck. Do not try Hexapods if you're liable to get night chained, burn to rider roads, or have a skill issue. Ask your shaman if hexapods are right for you. Now let's rank the naval units. Starting from the bottom in F tier, we have the lowly raft. Not even really a unit so much as a stage between a land unit and a naval unit. Rafts are good for becoming something else, or slowly drifting across the map to secure some cities. Let's be clear, this is nobody's favorite unit and you don't need us to explain why. In C tier, we have the Bomber. Bombers are good, but only in certain situations. They're locked behind a tier 3 tech, cost 15 stars, and are very vulnerable. Unless you can drop your Bomber in a spot you're sure your opponent cannot reach, you can forget about ever using these. They're a lot like catapults, but cost twice as much and do less damage. Splash damage is a huge plus, but most other naval units are more cost effective than bombers. The A tier starts off with the Rammer. The Rammer is a wonderful melee unit on the water with high attack and high defense that will tear through enemy naval units. They suffer a bit from not having the high range typical of aquatic units, but more than make up for it with their high stats. Overall, a solid unit that gets the job done. Next up, the Scout. Scouts come from a more valuable tech than Rammers, allowing a player to navigate ocean tiles and leading on towards bombers and starfish. They're fantastic units for exploring a map and dealing damage without retaliation. But they're also frail and expensive at five stars, which prevents them from being a truly spammable unit like an S-tier unit could be. Lastly, in A-tier are cloak boats, also called dinghies, and dagger boats, aka pirates. As before, we're talking about these two in combination. Also, just like how they act on land, they are effective at stealing stars and infiltrating behind enemy lines. But they take a while to reach the target from the water. What's interesting about pirates, though, is that they disband for more stars than regular daggers do, which is worth keeping in mind. Hey, hey, don't skip, don't skip. Well, this is the Rammer LLC, and we've just noticed something. You haven't been using Rammers in your recent games. <laughs> That's pretty funny. 
because what else we've noticed is that you have two perfectly functioning kneecaps right now. If we want to keep things this way, something else has to change. We want to see you using more rammers in your games, alright? Okay, thank you. Back to your video. Just like with B tier, we will leave S tier empty for now and come back with some special tribe naval units. Below even rafts, we have pufferfish. Unlike catapults, which have the decency to be found in a useful tech, pufferfish are locked behind Aquarion's mathematics. Let's be real, Aquarion terrain and water maps are not good for sawmills. While puffers can flood terrain with their attack, this does not justify the cost. Puffers are useless, unwanted, and leave you with sadness as you quietly move them into a little corner and forget that they exist. Looking at the C tier, we have the shark. Sharks look like they have all the features of our higher tier units, good attack, no retaliation, good movement, so what gives? While they may not have to deal with retaliation directly, they also don't have escape. So a unit with such bad defenses like this can expect to get killed after a single attack. What's worse, sharks cost 8 stars. In most games, you'll buy a shark and need to kill an opponent's unit that can equal this cost in one turn, or you're out of luck. So unless your opponent is keen on training their own sharks for yours to snack on, these guys have limited utility. Maybe they can help you secure a village early on or before your opponent's defenses are locked down, but overall, they're not that great. In a B tier for special naval units is the Fichi. Fichi are still lackluster, but they gain a very important role as explorers for Simanti on water maps. Because they can fly, these units are more useful on water than on land. Before the Aquarian rework, Tridentians were S tier units. Now they've dropped to B. The reason why is that Tridentians used to have 3 attack and escape. Now they have 2.5 attack and persist. Another reason for the demotion is that the free diving tech doesn't allow access to deep water tiles any longer. It's not all bad though. Tridents have 2 movement and deal range damage, plus the ability to chain opponents' units is nice. However, they usually need support from other units to be effective. Next up, the Mooney. Moonies are the best units for expanding Polaris's ice, the cornerstone of their entire game plan. Moonies would be ranked higher if they had better defense or didn't cost full five stars. And Moonies are limited the same way ice archers are, not dealing any direct damage themselves. However, their ability to sneak up and freeze opponent's units while spreading ice enables the rest of Polaris units to really take off. Reiji are Symanti's last and maybe their only real naval unit. If you're used to Symanti on Drylam's maps, you may be confused by these things' existence. They're often a tech branch past fishing you've probably never visited, spare the occasional ruin that hates you. But these things are monsters on the water. They're a lot like Dumex in that they have a strong attack and can explode, but they're also a bit like rammers. The main thing holding Raichi back is that their stats are worse than a rammer, and they're expected to do all of Symanti's naval battles alone without the kind of support that rammers get. First off in S tier, we have the Aquarian unit formerly known as the Yelly Belly. These new units are super fun, and with a cost of 8 stars and the tentacle ability to damage multiple units passively, they are amazing. Jellies have a weakness to ranged units, but with the high health, they're very spammable, absorbing most of your opponent's naval attacks. Combined with other units, they're even more effective. Our final inductee into the S tier for naval units is the Ice Sled. Sleds are only one tech away for Polaris with impressive health, attack, and range. Technically, they don't go in the water, but with dash, escape, and skate, sleds are the best at moving across the water compared to any other unit in the game. They're like riders on steroids and the cornerstone of any Polaris player's strategy to expand and dominate. For our last list, let's treat you to how all the different super units fare against one another. 
Honestly, they're all pretty good, and none are broken enough to qualify for the F tier. Looking at C tier, we have the Juggernaut. It's a powerhouse that deals splash damage as it moves. It has all the pros of a giant and an extra tile of mobility through the water. However, the stiff trait is what brings this unit down. Not being able to deal retaliation limits its usefulness. By the time it reaches an opponent's city to siege, it's often so weak it's ready to die. We have to put the humble giant in B tier. Despite being the original super unit and having the strongest attack in the game at 5, giants are slow. Like, really slow. Among all the super units, this vanilla cupcake doesn't have any rainbow sprinkles. It just hits hard and takes a ton of damage. Giants are very good, but without the special abilities of some of the other super units. The other super unit in B tier is the Gami. Gamis are very solid units, but after the Moonies gained the ability to auto-freeze, they became a far less important tool in Polaris' toolbox. They still fill a hole as bulky ice makers, but their lack of health is a detriment. Also, compared to Giants, Gamis appear in later turns due to Polaris' weaker early game economy. Then, once Gamis are in the game, Moonies and Sleds should be doing most of the heavy lifting. Starting A tier, we have the Centipede. Centipedes have low defense and health compared to other super units, but they make up for it with their other features. First, you can get centipedes fast. Symantec can quickly push out a super unit thanks to their two capital fungi. Second, Symantec's low health isn't that bad when you consider their ability to eat and produce segments. Lastly, they've got dash, so they can move, attack, and siege all on one turn. No other super unit can do that. Following up centipedes is a dragon. With their splash damage and fly ability, dragons are one of a kind. Fly gives them immunity to any kind of terrain on the map. Mountains, forests, fields, even deep ocean tiles are all the same to them. However, Illyrian struggles more than other tribes to get enough population to grow their cities. Plus, none of the other super units have an incubation period that lasts as long as some entire games do. Good luck getting an egg that can last long enough to reach that adult stage. But when you do, it tears armies apart. Dragons are perfect for softening up a group of units for a knight to chain through and destroy. Last in A tier, we have the crab. Crabs have gotten a glow up recently with improved range and the highest defense of any non-walled unit in the game. It's a regular giant, but better in every way, including the ability to close in on a city after killing an opponent's unit with escape. Plus, they can swim, no port required, making them ideal for picking off cities on land or sea. Okay, those are all the units in Polytopia ranked from worst to best. I'd like to thank these Poly Champions players for their help with this tier list. I'm sure some of you disagree with these lists, so leave us a comment about what your favorite units are and why. Want to learn to play Polytopia better? Join our Discord. A link to the Discord server is in the description. Take care. See you on the next one.